Um, hi, uh, again, my, my name is Miguel A. Calles. I'm here to share some lessons learned, uh, costly ones, from serverless computing. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with sharing who we are and a little bit about our serverless journey. Uh, so Veritol is a startup in the tolling and transportation industry. Uh, we believe in bringing innovation to the industry by leveraging mobile, crowdsource, and cloud-based technologies. In order to bring, bring this innovation to the industry, we also need innovative technologies. And that's how we landed on serverless. With serverless, we're allowed to focus on application development and, and re, re, uh, develop rapidly and deploy rapidly. We can do it with less infrastructure than typically done with server-based approach. We can also reduce our maintenance overhead throughout the software development life cycle. And if properly designed, we can lower our costs as well. Uh, so some of you may be wondering what serverless is. Uh, serverless is a technology that allows you to de deploy applications without having to manage a server. Um, some wonder, well, how can you have technology without a server? And I agree, there's got to be a server somewhere within the technology stack. but the point is, we don't have to provision it, we don't have to configure it, we don't have to manage it, we don't have to secure it. It, it. There's underlying technology there that we just need to upload our function code or our configuration, and we can then focus on developing the application, putting all the pieces together. Uh, so it makes development a lot quicker. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what serverless looks like, uh, we, we built Auditol, one of our platforms, using Amazon Web Services. Uh, so we have a serverless website and a serverless backend. So for the website, we are leveraging three um, major services on AWS. Our Route 53 for domain name service, DNS. S3 for hosting or object storage. And CloudFront for a content delivery network, or CDN. So what happens when... Uh, a user goes to our web application, auditol.io, uh, Route 53 resolves that to an IP address. That IP address then gets uh, redirected to CloudFront that does CDN. If the desired content has already been cached at the edge, then it just serves that cached content really quickly back to the web app. In the event that it's not cached, it goes to S3 obtains the content and then serves it back to the web, web application. Now our website also needs a backend and our mobile app uh, uses a backend as well. Uh, we do this by leveraging three other AWS services, uh, API gateway for defining API endpoints using the rest, restful designs. Lambda for serverless functions and DynamoDB for serverless database tables. So what happens when the mobile app or the website need to get data from the back end? They make an API call that gets sent to API Gateway. API Gateway will then forward that request event to a Lambda function. The function will process the event and do what it needs to. It may need to read or write to a database and send data back. Uh, so once it does its execution, it sends the data back to the gateway and the gateway sends it back to the mobile app or website. So hopefully this gives you a feel for what serverless looks like uh, and how a typical service, serverless design uh, uh, is, 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 is uh, implemented. So here's the bulk of the talk. I <laughs> share some, some lessons learned. Um, so there's going to be a structure to this. Uh, we're going to have a category and describe the scenario, the lesson we learned, the remediation we put uh, in place to address our finding and conclude with some risk and mitigations you, you can take, take away to avoid similar scenarios. The first category is inputs. Uh, OWASP serverless top 10 uh, identified input injection as the number one uh, uh, top security risk. So in this scenario, what we had is we had a, an API endpoint that gets uh, sends data to a Lambda function and it reads from a database. And we found that this database changes very infrequently. So it doesn't change very often. We implemented API gateway cache so that uh, once the API request comes, it 
the gateway can serve it right back, uh, similar to what a CDN does. That way it doesn't ever have to do a Lambda function call and a database read in, in, uh, for most situations. But there were times when the database did get updated and we don't want to serve old cache data. So we had a different process in place where the, when the database is updated, it would send an update event to a Lambda function. The Lambda function will then say, oh, I got an update. I'm going to click, I'm going to send a request to the API gateway and have it clear its cache. Seems pretty straightforward, right? What we found was that there was accidental um, injection attacks that we weren't expecting. Uh, for whatever reason, sometimes AWS would send the Lambda function old events. So the table had not been updated recently, but yet it was still sending old events uh, that it, the Lambda function, uh, that shouldn't have, should have not happened. Uh, so the, the function was saying, oh, I got an event, send the, a, a, a clear cache request to the gateway. Oh, I got another one, clear cache, clear cache. It was happening so many times in a very short period of time. And the API gateway ended up getting so overwhelmed that said, I'm not making any more, I'm not accepting any more requests. And even from API endpoints over HTTP using the RESTful protocol, ended up turning into a self-induced denial of service attack. Yikes. So we had some outages that we were not planning. So to remediate this, what we ended up putting in place was uh, we had the, the function do input validation according to the, the number one risk um, recommendation to mitigate that. Uh, so it only processed the newest events. We also had the Lambda function keep track of when the last uh, cache clearing happened and limit it to every five, event, uh, five minutes so that you can only clear the cache once every five minutes to avoid overwhelming the API gateway. So this kind of describes how you can avoid input injection attacks, even accidental ones. Uh, just as a side note, uh, we ended up determining that the, la the database only gets updated during the release process um, based on some configuration parameters and build specific changes. So we went away from this paradigm that we have here in the diagram and started using serverless plugins. And when there was a release in the CICD pipeline, the, the serverless plugin would make the API call to the, the gateway and say, clear the cache uh, because the database was being updated at that time during the release. Uh, so we mentioned some of the risks. Uh, so code injection, it could be SQL commands, um, uh, AWS commands, uh, GraphQL, uh, if you're using like the AppSync func uh, uh, service, the, the, there's a nested uh, recursive attack. This really awesome demo from the OWASP, uh, ca uh, AppSec Cali 2019, that shows that demo, how it turned into like a couple minute long execution and, and at a thousand times, it ended up being several thousand dollar cost. Um, so re regular expression attacks. And uh, if there's a bad input, it could result in unexpected 500 error if, if not planned properly. So to mitigate, make sure you always validate your inputs do safe to deserialize your inputs like JSON and make sure you have safe regular expressions. If in the event there is a code ejection attack that makes it through, make sure you have the lowest identity and access management privileges so that it cannot execute any unintended functions. Take advantage of great tools that are built into IDEs or as plugins, put them into the CACD pipeline to do linting and static code analysis and uh, take advantage of try catch blocks. You, you can exit gracefully when uh, a, a bad input makes it through. So the next one is on rate limiting. Well, typical for most uh, multi-factor two-step verification. We had, a, we had implemented a mobile app for client. Uh, so user needed to log in it sent the API request to the gateway. Then it gets sent to the function. The function then verifies the username and password against the identity provider. Awesome. I didn't, if it's successful, the identity provider sends a two digit code via SMS to the phone. The user then uh, entered the six digit code, uh, sent the API request function verifies against the identity provider. Cool, all successful. The user is logged in and gets a JSON web token back uh, to have the session on the application. Well, uh, we found during penetration testing that uh, the process, the business logic looks good, but there was a, 
un unexpected flaw in the design, someone could do a brute force attack, try a million codes and bypass the two-step verification. Yikes. So what we did to remedy this is we did a rate limiting at the API gateway. So only a certain number of requests can make it through in any given minute and also do lockouts. If it failed, let's say after three failed attempts, either the username and password or the verification code, then it would do a lockout and you couldn't log in for uh, do, do another attempt for a, a period of time. We also decided to do a moving target. If in the event that the incorrect code was sent, uh, it would then send another six digit code so that there's always a moving target. You couldn't just uh, pick, uh, try to get the same code. Um, so we, so uh, the, if, uh, by not having rate limiting, uh, your application could be vulnerable to brute force attacks, uh, bot scraping, uh, or analyzing your application and various denial of service attacks. Um, and then the costly part is you could have a cost spike that could uh, increase your cost. And if it's an extended period of time, it can be very costly. So, so the way to help mitigate against these things is to have web application firewalls. You can put a, a WAF in front of your web application and also in front of the API to help reduce uh, uh, brute forcing bots, denial of service attacks. Uh, also wanted to mention that you should be monitoring um, usage, errors, uh, and all uh, just understanding what your application is doing and your billing so that you can uh, know when something anomalous is happening, you can uh, address it right away and avoid an, uh, a surprise bill later on. All right, so over provisioning, um, just for simplicity and just to keep the configuration on our serverless framework file looking clean, we had defaulted to uh, default uh, uh, a compute size, default timeouts, and set a standard read-write provision for the database. Well, what we found was if sometimes bugs sneak into releases, um, and, and when and when they go live, all of a sudden you have all these errors popping up, and it could be many error errors being uh, re realized. And if you have the maximum compute and the maximum timeout, well, you're going to be paying for all that execution time. Uh, and it gets more expensive the longer and the bigger the compute sizes. Uh, and same thing with uh, provision read write capacity. If, if you just for simplicity make it a big uh, amount of provision, then well, you have, you're going to be paying for that while it's happening. So that can get really costly as well. Uh, so to remedy these situations, we uh, understood how each function uh, f executes and try to optimize it. So sometimes having low memory or low CPU is fine if the function does very simple things, but it, sometimes it's better to pay for more compute and memory uh, when, uh, if the function is intensive. Yeah, so if, yeah, maybe more costly at the compute side, but the execution time is smaller. And so it kind of offsets and ends up being more cost efficient. Um, then also understanding how long a function typically executes and then understanding uh, how long, what's the maximum time it should need before it, uh, it, it times out. Sometimes you can do it during unit testing or, or integration testing that in certain, uh, bogus or erroneous inputs to see how the functions execute um, with an error. So then that way you can, if a function typically takes two seconds, maybe you could cap it off four seconds. Uh, so that's usually the longest it would need to execute for an error. For a database, we decided to move to on-demand. We had very spiky traffic. Uh, so there was no need to have constant provision uh, uh, resources. Uh, read write. Uh, so the, uh, the having uh, to pay more per write and read request ended up being more cost efficient, uh, and then having a dedicated amount. Um, something to keep in mind, though, is if if there is if you're not uh, doing rate limiting on your functions that read and write against the database, um, a, a cost spike or a, an attack could be expensive. 
So something just uh, tying it back to rate limiting, uh, that's a mitigation for on-demand database read and write capacity units. Uh, so we talked about the risk um, for just the mitigations, understand how your application functions and uh, size it appropriately. Uh, so for over privilege policies, again, this is a, a risk in the serverless top 10. Um, so what we've uh, what we what we're doing uh, again, you know, just developer simplicity, all the required uh, IM privileges uh, for every function were put in the default role, and so that what that resulted is functions were now being given overly permissive policies. They were allowed to do things that we're not supposed to do. So for example, this one function is meant to just read uh, a database, uh, but we found that uh, it could do something like uh, modify the IAM password policy. So you see on the left side of the function, there's a overly permissive policy there. I made it admin just to get the point across that uh, if you have overly permissive or admin privileges, uh, some bad things can happen. So what we did is we crafted some malicious intent, uh, a remote execution attack. We were able to successfully modify the IAM password policy. So that's, that's not good. Um, so what we decided to do was to stop using the default role and do one IAM role per function so that the policy was limited to what it was done. So you see the, 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 the change on the left-hand side in the JSON that it, 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 this function is only allowed to query and it's only allowed to query a specific table. So that way, uh, when we tried the malicious uh, remote execution attack again, uh, we were not able to modify the IAM, uh, the IAM password policy. Uh, so the risk of having over, over permissive, over privileged policies and roles is that a malicious actor can uh, do execution attacks, get, do lateral movements through your AWS infrastructure, could need to account takeover uh, uh, take uh, account takeovers and data leakage. I believe the Capital One breach from a couple of years ago was a result of over permissive uh, IAM policies. Uh, so we mentioned some, uh, I mentioned the, the remediations, those are mitigations you can put in place. I highly encourage leveraging uh, temporary credentials. So AWS has a service called Security Token Service where it could issue uh, a limited lifetime credentials. So rather than having an, an access key that lives on forever until revoked, uh, so, uh, and it's set, let's say, to uh, ha has wild cards all over its policy. Uh, policy. You can just do, uh, if you can, least privilege. Uh, but even if it's admin or very permissive, it's short lived, like 15 minutes. Uh, that way, uh, in your CI/CD pipeline, and even on your own developer machine, you can keep the policy short lived, uh, act active, short and short lived. Another thing we found that was really costly was failure, uh, not check, keeping track of AWS uh, service outages and failures in our application. Um, as great as these cloud providers can be, they, they do experience outages. Um, and so if, uh, if we're not aware that there's an outage and we're not keeping track of, let's say 500 errors as a result of an outage or 500 errors as a result of of a bot attack, uh, it can have cost implications. It could affect, uh, result in data loss. In one of our uh, client applications, we found that it was an out AWS outage in, in for over an hour, and we were losing pricing data, so we couldn't our bill our customers accurately, and that's bad. Uh, that's not good. Uh, so we started monitoring uh, when when AWS went down, uh, do some internal monitoring as well to see if we, see if we can detect it before AWS reports it officially, uh, keeping track of when 500 errors. And we started exploring multi-region design. So if, let's say, um, North Virginia was down in AWS and, and, and Ohio was functioning, our application can still keep running. Uh, that comes in handy when uh, you let's, if, uh, so, uh, so related to multi-region, you can do multi-cloud designs as well. Um, summer of 2020, uh, Azure had an outage in every region, I think, for 
uh, you know, an hour or two. And so if, you, if your application was solely hosted on Azure, you, your application would be down completely. But let's say if you had uh, designed it so that it can run on Google Cloud and also on AWS, then uh, your application can still be running, maybe in a degraded state, but it'd still be up. Uh, so some of the risks that we mentioned, uh, we, we experienced data loss. Uh, a, an attacker can use uh, 500 messages um, for reconnaissance. So if we're not tracking that there are spikes in 500 messages, we may, we not, may not realize that our application's being investigated. Um, but yeah, I just recommend using monitoring and alerting to be aware of that this is happening. And for your clients, uh, leverage local storage. A web, the web browsers and mobile apps have local storage and session storage and secure storage. You can put your data there first and then make the API call. And if the API call fails, you, it'll still be stored locally so that uh, the next time the service is back up, you can try again to write the data. Lastly, I want to conclude with cost engineering. Um, so it's just it's cost engineering is the exercise of understanding your costs, understanding how your application works and how you can keep your application functioning as efficiently as possible with the lowest amount of cost. Uh, so it's related to uh, many of the things we've uh, already pr presented earlier. Uh, so in this example, we launched a serverless application uh, and, when, and it went operational. And as we started adding more customers, we, we started seeing slight cost increase. And then it noticed the cost was increasing significantly by June of that year. And um, by, by the time we uh, started look, thinking about doing something about it, it was July. Uh, so at our peak, this is relative cost. So the, the peak is in, in June, and that's uh, the highest cost. And so we decided to understand what our application, how our, our application was designed and how we can keep our costs low. So we started doing a cost engineering uh, exercise in July and by August, it's, we started seeing lower costs and we kept continu continuing to do that over, over uh, two, two to three months. And, and by, uh, by October, we were at 98% of the cost from the peak in June. Uh, so we found this to be very powerful that we didn't have to change very much in our application. Uh, just with some optimization, we can still have the same level, uh, same design and same level of quality for application, but at 98% of our cost. And that's huge. That, 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 that can be a game changer, especially if you're trying to run lean and mean. So just, uh, just as mentioned, there's, it can be expensive and cost I would, by uh, not doing cost engineering, it, you may be paying for more than what you need to. Uh, so some things you can do to help with uh, cost engineering is to do price analysis. Uh, there may be uh, some services that are similar enough, uh, either within this, the same cloud provider or across different cloud providers. And one, uh, one may be cheaper and still provide the same uh, uh, benefits and may still meet your requirements. Uh, so you can just choose the less expensive one. Uh, uh, recommend doing stress tests on your system before making it uh, live, putting it into production. And that way you can see how your system reacts when it's under a load and you can catch potential cost spikes in advance and actually potentially uh, mitigate them uh, ahead, ahead of time before they even happen. And as mentioned before, just monitor, monitor your application, monitor your costs, make sure you understand how it's operating so you can uh, catch anomalies. Uh, so in the spirit of a 20th anniversary, we want to think what is Veritol trying to achieve for the next 20 years in the tolling industry and how do, how do we uh, do that securely? So our, our goal is to reduce the total cost to collect for a toll operator so that they have to only spend a few cents to collect their, their tolls cost from customers. And so we believe we can do that through cloud computing, especially serverless technologies uh, serverless allows us to scale up very quickly. And as you saw from cost engineering, we can aim to keep costs much lower, which we can then pass on to our customers and allow the, the tolling agencies, the tolling operators 
to pass on their cost savings onto their customers as well, maybe in the form of a lower toll payments. We also want to uh, provide a way, a secure way, a private, a, 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 to uh, people to work off their tolls uh, so that they can use mobile apps and cloud-based services to, to, to earn income to help offset their toll costs, you know, giving them opportunities uh, maybe for a, a better job that's uh, further away from where they live. As, so as you may uh, wonder, there's going to be a lot of transactions, a lot of processing in the cloud. It's going to be sensitive data like license plates, uh, names, addresses, billing information, GPS data. And so we believe we can do that at scale with serverless and also do it securely uh, by leveraging uh, proper cloud uh, security principles. So there's uh, many resources out there for those of you interested in serverless and serverless security. Uh, OWASP has the top 10, the Cloud Security Alliance has their, their 12, top 12. There's many good blog posts on serverless best practices, serverless security. There are books on, on serverless from APRESS and O'Reilly. And uh, there's the, the cloud provider documentation. I find it really helpful. I read through that a lot because um, they, in many of their configuration guides have se sections for how do you configure it? How do you do a proper architecture? And even some security things you keep in mind. And there's GitHub repositories also that have compilations of serverless content as well. I noted one of them here. So I'd love to hear from you. I'll, I'll be on the Slack channel to answer any questions, uh, but uh, do uh, contact me via email and LinkedIn. And uh, I am a published author and I do write a uh, write, uh, post content on my blog. So uh, check out my site. Thank you so much. I hope you found this presentation helpful. And I just want to share that APRESS has agreed to do a book giveaway for serverless security. So if you're interested, go to my website, go to the OWASP20 address and uh, enter your email for a chance to win. Thanks again.